Chapter 11 Christ the Messiah Knowing Christ and making Him known is the church's ultimate assignment. Jesus did what man could not do for himself, so that he can have the right to give to man what he needed, eternal life. Good works without Christ is far from being holy. He is the totality of righteousness in whom dwells the fullness of the Godhead. You must be complete in Him. When one who does not believe in Christ abstains from fornication, it's a righteous act worthy of the Father's praise. Yet, the Father says this kind of righteousness is like a filthy rag before Him. Another person also believes in Christ and abstains from fornication. God calls His body a holy temple and comes to dwell in. He gives honor to this kind of righteousness. What makes the difference then? It's not the act, but Christ. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, He will give it to you. John 16, 23 If I say to you, God bless you, it's a statement and not a prayer. It becomes a prayer when I say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Different voices are saying different things on earth, but the ones that break the heavenly canopy into the throne room of God are the ones that are said in the name of Jesus. Words enveloped in the name of Jesus receive special attention from God. No matter how you put your words together, the only time God will acknowledge that you are speaking to Him is when you end by saying, In the name of Jesus. Jesus makes a difference in prayer also. He is indispensable in our walk with God. He is the one who attaches significance to our endeavors before the Father. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will also live because of me. John 6, 57 I call this the because of Jesus life. It might seem simple and funny, but this is a reality in Zion. Every believer is living on Christ's account. It is for His sake that the Father will be committed to any believer's well-being. The eternal life, divine favor, and supernatural power you're enjoying is because of Jesus Christ and not you. God refers to Jesus before He acts. The only role you played in acquiring this life is the decision you made to believe on Jesus and remain obedient to Him. Jesus Christ is the reason for everything else happening to you. There is another mind-blowing scripture in Ephesians 3.12. In Him and through faith in Him, Christ, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. It's obvious that we can approach God for anything with a sense of freedom and confidence because of Christ, not with guilty conscience or doubt. We can approach the throne of grace to seek help anytime, so far as Christ is masking us. Prayer got better with Christ. God will not do you good because you are good, but because His Son wants Him to. This is something you must really understand. That is why if you need anything from the Father, you must fix your relationship with Christ Jesus. Christ has a right standing with the Father, and you must have a right standing with Christ through faith so that He can represent you before the Father. The Father sees only Christ and everything in Him. God deals with Christ, and Christ deals with us. God does not associate with anything that is not Christ-like. Therefore, to deal with God, one must be clothed with Christ. This is what Jacob did to attain the blessings that belong to Esau. He covered himself with the outlook of Esau and the father had no option than to bless him. Jesus Christ allows anyone who believes in him to go before the father with his personality. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with him. Galatians 3.27 Physically, nothing changed about your appearance when you became born again. But spiritually, you are changed into the image of Christ. You look exactly like Christ. The Father does not differentiate between you and Christ. He sees us the same and treats us as good as He treated Christ when He was on earth. There is no gentle or Jew, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Colossians 3.11 There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28 Christ has sacrificially made Himself Esau, so we as Jacob can use His name and personality to approach the Father. We are in the season where the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ must be commemorated. We believe that in His crucifixion, He became what we were. He took our sins upon Himself. 
He acted like us so he will be punished on our behalf. He endured in his own body the penalty of our sins. He experienced three awful days in hell for us. Because of us, though he had never sinned, he was bruised and wounded as the worst sinner that ever lived. In his resurrection, we see ourselves as he is. He died for our sins and arose in his righteousness for us by faith. We have an unending life in us. We have his exceeding great power at work through our spirits. To the human mind, we can only think of this action as the highest expression of love. A love undeserved, a favor unearned, and a sacrifice unmerited was given man by God through his Son Jesus Christ, which is doubtless the demonstration of his grace towards man. Salvation, the desire of the prophets. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us thy did minister the things. 1 Peter 1 10 12. The prophets, in reference to Isaiah, David, Jeremiah, Zechariah, among others, were not ignorant of the great reformation that we see today. They had a pellucid revelation about the salvation through Christ Jesus. They saw in visions the sacrifice of Christ and the glory that is behind it. They saw a church that by this sacrifice will be made custodians of God's total nature and glory. They received God in bits and in pieces as God revealed himself to them differently in different dispensations. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by the name Jehovah, was I not known to them. Exodus 6.3 Different people in different dispensation were privy to that part of God he decided to show them. They had no means to explore where God had not revealed. They were limited to knowing God. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. Deuteronomy 29, 29 God had secrets he had kept from them and was not going to reveal it to them. No matter how well they behave themselves, he was not ready to reveal his totality to them. However, the prophets of their day saw in visions a church that will have access to the totality of God. A church whom by the Spirit would decide what they want to see about God and not God deciding for them. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the church, came in the full capacity of the Godhead. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9. In Christ Jesus dwells the fullness thereof. He carried in His body the full nature and glory of the Father and the Holy Spirit. He was a total revelation of the Godhead. Know who you are for yourself, and you are complete in Him. Colossians 2.10 It might be difficult to understand this very well. The Amplified Version of the Scripture throws more light. And you are in Him, made full, and having come to fullness of life. In Christ, you too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and reach full spiritual stature. We have been fused into Christ, made one body with Him, and now we both carry the Godhead. We don't have an aspect of God. We have His totality. There is no secret between God and us. The deep things of God have been revealed to us. Hallelujah! Paul says that. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to them for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to the saints. Colossians 1 verse 2 and 26. Through Christ, we have access not only to know, but also to possess everything in the Godhead. We are carriers of God. Nothing about God is hidden from us because of Jesus. We know God in full. This is the blessing the people of old desired to have, but it was reserved for us. The prophets desired this great blessing of having a no-boundary relationship with God. Though God walked with them, kept many secrets from them, and in the appointed time, he unveiled the mysteries to us. When the people unto whom Jesus came were not grasping the eternal message he preached, he began to tell them how the prophets longed to see our dispensation. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Matthew 13 verse 17 
Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. John 8 verse 56 The system of secrecy changed when the veil was parted into two. God was made manifest to the church. This is the desire of the great men and women we see in the Old Testament. To them, they could have achieved greater things if they had access to what we have. The paradox of this mystery is that, while they desired to have what was to be done for us, we end up desiring what was done with them. It is more honorable in heaven to have God dwelling in you than to part the Red Sea. We know God in full and have Him in full measure. The greatest thing salvation does for us is not to take us to heaven, no, but God finding us worthy to dwell in us and have an eternal relationship with us. It is written that heaven and earth shall pass. When you receive salvation, you receive the right to be wherever God is. You can live a heavenly life on earth if God dwells in you. It is His presence and glory that makes heaven the way it is, and His full glory and nature in you can create around you the atmosphere of heaven. Value your salvation. Value our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation, a surprise to holy angels. Now you know the good news about Jesus Christ, God's spirits that He has sent from heaven, has helped people to tell the good news to you. Even the angels want very much to understand these things. 1 Peter 1 12. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word that created all things, the truth and glory of the Father, was made flesh and blood so that he could die to redeem the sinful man. To the man, this was a normal, prosaic action. But to an angel, it was an extraordinary act of God. Only Moses, out of the billions of men that have lived, had the opportunity to see the back parts of God in his glory. The world had only heard about his glory but has not encountered it. So it's somewhat normal for earthly mortal man to hear that God had died for him. But angels know God in His glory. They see Him in His splendor and from eternity have been worshipping His majesty. So for God the Son to lower Himself to come on earth in the form of flesh and blood, just to die and save mankind, was and is still a mystery to the host of angels. Apostle Peter tells of how angels are eager to look into this gospel. They have a keen interest in man's salvation through Christ, not out of jealousy, but out of amazement. So they say among themselves, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visits? Psalm 8 verse 4 Angels through the gospel want to find out why God the Son had to be mindful of the creatures made of clay, leave the heavens for thirty-three years, to dwell among them, and at the end die for man. Peter says here that any time the Holy Spirit inspires us to preach the gospel of Christ Jesus, angels give attentive ear to the word. They want to understand why the Father sacrificed the Son. They are amazed that the Word had to leave heaven for 33 years to visit men. There was no Word in heaven. The place was in total silence for these number of years. They look at men and wonder why God is so mindful of us. This makes them love and honor us the more. Thoughts of how God loves us makes them see a specialty in man. Angels could strike men with blindness and all kinds of calamities, but not when Jesus was sacrificed for us. Angels now value and honor the church because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They are keen on learning more about the gospel each day. They pay attention to church services even more than many Christians do. They are sent each day to minister for the heirs of salvation. Hebrews 1 verse 14 They don't minister any more to us, but for us. They stand for a command from us and quickly execute it. Angels value you because Christ valued you and gave himself as a sacrifice for you. Salvation, an envy of fallen angels, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8 Satan knew he was crucifying the very Son of God, but he never knew that he was fostering the redemptive plan of God to save mankind. If he knew that man was going to receive the free gift of salvation, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. The devil and all the fallen angels are bitter about God's love for mankind. They sinned just once, and God showed them no mercy. God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness 
to be reserved unto judgment. 1 Peter 2 verse 4 To all falling spirits, there's an unjust God in heaven. They don't see God as just because he spared man. They saw a God who loved man and would do anything for him right from the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, the host of falling angels expected God to treat mankind the same way he treated them. They expected God to end the race of mankind by casting them down to hell, where they belonged. God, however, looked upon mankind with an eye of pity. Though he didn't forgive them, he didn't destroy them either. Mercy spoke and their lives were spared. God then, then, right after the fall, began to work out a redemptive plan. The love of God for man angered the demons to hate us the more. They resorted to a very devilish plan to infiltrate the race of mankind. They began to reproduce with the daughters of men. The outcome were children who had both the traits of demons and human beings. They became giants with strange abilities. The demons did that to discourage God from giving mankind the love he had planned to show us. The new breeds brought evil that God could no more bear with. Some divine beings noticed how attractive human women were. So they took wives for themselves for a selection that pleased them. There were giants on the earth at that time when those divine beings were having sexual relations with those human women who gave birth to children for them. These children became the heroes and legendary figures of ancient times. The Lord saw that human evil was growing more and more throughout the earth, with every inclination of people's thoughts becoming only evil on a continuous basis. Then the Lord regretted that He had made human beings on the earth, and He was deeply grieved about it. So the Lord said, I will annihilate these human beings whom I have created from the earth. The Lord was pleased with Noah. Genesis 6 verse 2, 4 to 8 This interbreeding resulted in offsprings who were not fully human. They corrupted the genetic makeup of mankind. But God, who will have his way no matter the opposition, devised another plan. He destroyed the whole earth, including these new breeds, with a flood, saving only Noah and his family. He therefore started a new world with the eight-member family of Noah. Many years later, he sacrificed his own son to appease himself so that he could totally forgive mankind. The salvation of a soul is a provocation to the devil. The devil did everything possible for mankind to betray the love of God. He couldn't stop God from loving mankind, but he could inspire man to grieve God. Man's sins were grievous, yet God gave an offering for the atonement of man's iniquities, something he didn't do to redeem the fallen angels. The love of God for you is a mystery to fallen angels. That is why Satan will go to the elastic point just to deceive a person from accepting the saving grace of God. The devil is an enemy to your salvation.